Wayne Horvitz is joining us today, keyboardist, band leader, educator, and our favorite Northwest representative of the great downtown New York tradition of free improvisation. Wayne was born in New York in 1955. He relocated to Seattle in 1988, along with his other half, Robin Holcomb, who just turned 70. Happy birthday. Wayne co-founded the Royal Room in Seattle's Columbia City neighborhood in 2011, and it will be the venue for What's Going On, Conduction, Improvisation, and the Culture of Structure, which kicks off on Thursday, October 17th with Seattle Modern Orchestra. It resumes on October 23rd and runs through November 3rd with a series of events honoring three prominent figures, Julius Hemphill, Sun Ra, and Butch Morris. Complete details are available on the web at theroyalroomseattle.com. Wayne, thanks for coming on the show again. Sure, absolutely my pleasure. So you're co-producing most of these events with Earshot Jazz Festival, but the series is really your idea. How long have you been wanting to do this? I started thinking about this a long time. It was close to the anniversary of the death of Butch Morris. I've been doing a lot of things around conduction, but I wanted to broaden the field to the idea of how the sort of great tradition of great black music in America had really dealt with contemporary ideas of new music in terms of structure in ways that were both crossed over with the European tradition and also were, how should I put it, did not cross over with the European tradition. And the person to me who articulated this the best was was Cecil Taylor, who talked about a kind of um, Afrocentric way of looking at structure and a sort of relationship to the body. Um, and when I started to work with Butch Morris, who was a mentor to me and then later a very close friend, you know, he was doing things which was struggling with what happened in free improvisation that was both really positive and then sometimes, and in particular in larger ensembles, became unwieldy. And uh, I don't know if everyone would agree with that. In fact, I know a lot of people who wouldn't agree with that, but I think that was his perspective. And Butch was fascinated with aspects of contemporary European music. Um, and so, uh, but then, you know, I wanted to do something big, basically. And so I started to think of Sun Ra because he's so iconic in the culture. Sun Ra crosses over in a way that these other artists don't. You know, rock people really relate to Sun Ra in a certain way. I mean, the keyboard player in Fish did a big project around Sun Ra. Um, and Julius Hempel was just an important person in the 70s that I feel is also sort of long forgotten. But um, more importantly, Marty Ehrlich, who's a dear friend of mine, sort of had a relationship to, to Julius that was similar to the one I had to Butch. And Marty's a great scholar of Julius's. So a lot of stuff just got published of Julius's. So I thought it was a good time to talk about him as well. Marty is an alto saxophonist by trade. He'll be coming out from any of the events. Mm -hmm. He also curated a seven CD box set of archival Hempel recordings. Hempel was also an alto saxophone player and a band leader and composer. He was born in Fort Worth in 1938, spent some formative years in St. Louis, where he met Oliver Lake and Hammett Blewett, with whom he co-founded the World Saxophone Quartet. His other collaborators included Birk, Anthony Braxton, and your old friend Bill Frizzell. He passed away in 1995 from complications of diabetes. In a world of saxophonists, what makes Hemphill stand out? Well, I mean, he obviously had a really distinct sound. And like Ornette Coleman, I mean, you mentioned where he was born. Another Fort Worth native. Yeah, a Fort Worth native. He kind of had that blues band meets free jazz sense. Though when you get into the Chicago guys like Lester Bowie and even Roscoe Mitchell, there's a lot of that there as well. But I think in Julius's music, it's... it's um, sort of easier to hear and, easy, and easier to see. But I think the amazing contribution um, of Julius, like Butch, was bringing a lot of different disparate things together. I mean, you mentioned Bill, also Nels Klein, also Alex Klein. You know, he was looking to people in the kind of rock scene and people who were not sort of just in the straight kind of post Coltrane free jazz world and trying to bring elements together. And of course, the final thing is Julius wrote, an insane amount of music. And this is what Marty Ehrlich's been spending the last five, a considerable portion of his last five years doing, or greater than that. 
um, is getting all that music together and published. It's now all available. And when we get to the Seattle Modern Orchestra, we're doing a piece that's uh, that's essentially a classical piece that Julius wrote. So he had a wide, wide palette. That piece is called One Atmosphere, and it's for piano quintet. We're hearing it in the background. Is it fully composed? Yeah, absolutely. And that will be coming up this Thursday at the Royal Room with Seattle Modern Orchestra. And on Wednesday, October 23rd, also at the Royal Room, he'll be paying homage to his signature tune, Dogen A.D., which he recorded in 1972. We're hearing it in the background now. It's in 11 time, and it doesn't swing. What is it about that quirky, loping tune that's made it such a favorite among exploratory improvisers? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the fact that there's no bass and it's it's cello and drums, I think, you know, the people involved, but I just think it was, you know, revolutionary at the time. It has this kind of... You know, it certainly doesn't sound like any type of what we would consider European avant-garde music, but at the same time, it's not a rhythm section oriented. I mean, it is and it isn't. And um, I, I just, it just broke things wide open. And it's really, you know, it really goes back. I mean, it was early on in all of that music. Um, so many people refer to it as something that changed their lives when they heard it. And it's been covered many times, including right. by his student Tim Byrne and by Marty. Exactly, yeah. That brings us to Sun Ra. We hear his music a lot on Flotation Device. He was a very prolific recording artist. But unlike Hemphill, he wrote exclusively for his own musicians. You're going to honor two specific albums of his, Jazz and Silhouette and Space is the Place. How do you approach performing the music of such an eccentric character, whose work is closely associated with the orchestra, the costumes, the pamphlet poetry, Afrofuturism, and all that. Yeah, you know, it's funny you ask, because honestly, it's been uh, more daunting and more difficult than I realized be, for exactly that, because it was a, a, you know, not a cult, but it was a culture of people who work together and, you know, and all African-American people. And I'm basically taking this music, not only am I doing it with generally predominantly white bands here, and we're not going to have costumes and we're not going to try to be like they were, but I'm also doing it with the Garfield High School mm -hmm. jazz band. Um, and that's going to be on the Earshot Festival. And I really didn't think or worry about those issues till I started doing it. And then suddenly I thought, oh my God, I mean, you know, with Butch's music or Butch's approach or Julius's music. I mean, these are all things that people with music skills and music approaches and music philosophies could just all dive into. With Sunra, you're sort of going into somebody else's home, you know? And so, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm honestly a little nervous about it. You do have a Sunra veteran coming out I to do. join you. Henson Chancy is going to be coming out. And he's a great French horn player that I got to work with, with Butch and um, and and. Henson Chance, he also worked with Julius Hemphill, but he worked with Sun Ra for years and years and years. He was the one notable French horn player who recorded with Sun Ra. He also played with Carla Bley. And oh, Mingus. God, endless, yeah. And I worked with Vincent a ton. He was in my band, the New York Composers Orchestra, and a lot of other things. So it'll be great to have him and see him. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope we have conversations about it. I mean, we're old friends, so I'm not worried about it, but I think that it, it is going to be a pretty different experience for him, you know? Um, You'll be playing music from Jazz and Silhouette on Friday, November 1st. That album was recorded in 1959. It's a relatively straightforward swing album. What's that evening going to be like? Well, I just wanted to do it because I thought that you know, Sun Ra's legacy goes back to the fact that he arranged for the Henderson Orchestra, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, you know, I just felt that that should be represented. It's also just an album that I listen to a million times and love. So that's probably the main reason, you know. Um, and yeah, it is sort of straight ahead. But then when you get into transcribing it, it just sort of, you suddenly realize it just doesn't behave like other big band music does when you dig into the weeds with it. It's, it's, it's an odd one. And of course, there are a couple of tunes on there that are more quote unquote out including Ancient Ethiopia, which is playing now. Right, and I'm actually working on that track with uh, the Garfield Jazz Band, and these kids are sort of, you know, giggling and snickering and not quite sure what to make of it, and then when they get into it, it's, you know, it's really something. They, they, they have a great time. 
Well, they're reliving the career trajectory of Sun Ra, aren't they? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And that's Friday night, November 1st, at the Royal Room. All of these events are at 7.30, unless otherwise noted. Tickets and information at theroyalroomseattle.com. And then there's Space is the Place, which is a confusing title. It's a song by Sun Ra, a studio album by Sun Ra, and a feature film starring Sun Ra with its own soundtrack by Sun Ra. They all date from the 1972-73 time frame, and you'll be tackling that on Saturday, November 2nd with your Electric Circus Ensemble. How is that going to sound compared to Jazz and Silhouette? Well, that's going to be much less true to the record. I'm not trying to replicate what happens on the record because that would be impossible. And, I don't, and obviously it's very open. So I'm basically going to sort of, I've built it as sort of a reimagining of space as the place. You know, I'm going to take the essential tunes, some of which are essentially improvisations anyway, and do the thing I always do with Electric Circus. So this is really where Butch Morris meets all of these things. I mean, I would say that in handling Julius's music, I'm using maybe the least amount of the conduction approach. Obviously, in Butch's music, that's very prominent. And in the reading of Sun Ra's Space is the Place, I'm going to use that considerably. I'm also going to use the conduction language in the Seattle Modern Orchestra piece that I'm going to bring in called Worst Planet Yet. And um, I haven't even created it yet. Um, it's going to be very sparse in terms of what's written and basically a conduction. I'm just going to take some various themes of Sun Ra's and then have this classical ensemble improvise with them. So that'll be interesting and daunting. And that last performance you mentioned with Seattle Modern Orchestra is this coming Thursday, October 17th. Mm -hmm. Now, Sun Ra had an unusual way of writing his compositions. He wrote out the instrumental parts directly. He didn't write a score. Can you get sheet music to most of his tunes, or do you have to transcribe them from the record? I'm transcribing most of them. Yeah, I found through an old friend, um, he sent me a whole pile of PDFs of Sun Ra lead sheets. And I think so far, one or two of them have saved me a little bit of time, but essentially I'm transcribing everything. I'm speaking with Wayne Horvitz about his upcoming performances at the Royal Room, most of them co-presented with this year's Earshot Jazz Festival. The series is entitled, What's Going On? It runs through Sunday, November 3rd. Showtimes are at 7.30 p.m. Tickets and information are available at theroyalroomseattle.com. Now, you brought up conductions, and Sun Ra did dabble in that in the 1960s. He would point to his musicians and use hand signals to guide them through group improvisations. But we associate that technique a lot more with Butch Morris, who is the third honoree in your series. He lived from 1947 to 2013, a cornetist by trade. And I think his influence pervades the whole series, doesn't it? Yeah, I started with wanting to, to honor Butch. I mean, as you said, in 2013, I actually started to try to make the festival happen last year, and it was just too daunting, and I didn't have the funding. Um, I got a significant grant from this uh, group called the Live Music Society for, for this. Otherwise, it just wouldn't happen. Um, and uh, so it started with Butch. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I, you know, I wanted to be broader than that and create a larger interest to the general public, but also address that different people were approaching the same issue of how to create structure and improvisation in other ways. And John Zorn, of course, did the same thing in his game pieces, which I was doing Butch's conduction and Zorn's game pieces in the early 80s, you know, literally at the same time. Same time as Naked City as well. Yeah, same time as Naked, or even a little before that as well. Um, so, but with Butch, it was also exciting for me because I got to meet a lot of people I wouldn't meet otherwise. With Zorn, it was basically our gang of people working together. With Butch, I got to work suddenly um, with Frank Lowe, with with um, with Billy Bang, with Eva, even um, Jimmy Lyons, who had played with Cecil Taylor. And, you know, a whole bunch of people from that scene who were the people I had moved to New York who I wanted to meet at that time. So it was, not, it was exciting for me just all around. Morris really was a key bridge figure, wasn't he? Absolutely. Between the African-American free jazz tradition and the more rock-oriented lineage of many of the downtown improvisers. And the classical new music world, and particularly when he did stuff in Europe. I mean, he often worked with basically young classical ensembles who were interested in contemporary music, and he brought this conduction thing to them. And I thought that was some of the best stuff that 
ever came out of that. Now, on Friday, October 25th, your Electric Circus Ensemble is revisiting something that Morris called New Blue. Yeah, yeah. New Blue was something I was never part of. It was, it's, it's just a club in, in New York. And he had an ensemble there. Kenny Wallison was in there. Doug Weiselman was in there. Brandon Ross was in that band. Sarah Schumbeck was in that band. Stephanie Richards was in that band. A lot of people. And, um, and you know, it rotated, kind of whoever was available. And it was a weekly thing, just like the Monday night thing that I do at the Royal Room sometimes. It's just a weekly thing. But he specifically kind of encouraged the players to play with grooves in a way that he didn't on his other conductions. So there tended to be, and Kenny was the drummer and he was a perfect candidate for that. He loved Butch, but he could also, you know, he's really into rhythm and laying it down. So those conductions tended to have more kind of, I don't know, a rock groove funk influence. And, um, and so that's what Electric Circus already does. So I'm gonna be basically just doing a fairly normal Electric Circus honoring the idea of that I got this from Butch, you know, and then I took it to another, not level, but just I, I took it down another avenue where I used little riffs and motifs from James Brown tunes and Sly and the Family Stone tunes and Los Lobos tunes and psychedelic rock tunes, etc. So that, that's the gig I've thought the least about so far, because in some ways it takes the least preparation, so I'm not <laughs> freaking out about it. But I will try to incorporate some of the things that he did that I don't generally do, which is to have the band improvise vamps instead of using vamps that are sort of predetermined. And you mentioned Brandon Ross, Steph Richards, Sarah Schoenbeck. They'll be coming out for that performance. Yeah. Also Marty Ehrlich and Darius Jones. And on Sunday, November 3rd, you'll wrap up the series with a tribute to his Dust to Dust album, which we're hearing in the background. Tell us about that performance. Well, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Butch was an, a beautiful cornet player, but he was also a beautiful writer. He wrote these quite lovely tunes. And the thing about the conduction thing for Butch is that he started doing it in the David Murray Big Band. And when he did it in the David Murray Big Band, he, David had charts and Butch was ta basically taking the charts and doing con and adding conduction to these arrangements, which is actually what I do with my band, the Royal Room Collective Music Ensemble. Then Butch got more and more interested in what I would term pure conduction, where there's no written music at all. Right around the time that was happening, he made this record for New World and um, that, that we're going to present and I, I produced that record and I also played on it um, Myra Melford was the pianist I was playing keyboards and she's coming and to Seattle herself to perform on October 27th with her fire and water quintet yeah she is I, I, I gather she is yeah um, and so I worked with Myra with Butch a lot at that time and we'd have two or three keyboardists sometimes in any event um, that's just got these lovely tunes but he still used conduction he doesn't play on the record I mean he had just stopped playing cornet at that time so uh, Zena Parkins is on that record um, Jean Paul Borelli, uh, a, a bunch of folks. It's interesting because it is kind of, you know, there's drums, there's piano, there's guitar, there's some horns, there's harp, but there is no bass. Um, so it's, it's got a kind of, um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a traditional rhythm section approach. Um, and that's going to take a lot of transcribing. I mean, I'm going to basically approach it the way he did, which is take these simple themes and make conductions out of them. After Morris passed away in 2013, you wrote an appreciation where you said he was the only person in your life that you regarded as a true mentor. What do you feel you get out of conduction that you can't get through either an unstructured improvisation or else by writing out all of the parts? Well, I think the, the, a lot of people are doing conduction now, and, um, and which is great. And of course, you know, as we've talked about, other people have used these approaches and classical players, even in the mid 20th century, use some ideas of breaking up the idea of what a conductor is. And if you go online and find the, the video, which is one of the first things that comes up when, when you Google Butch, it's a lecture he gave about conduction. The first thing he says is, you know, this has been going on for hundreds of years. And he talks, he says, he has this beautiful statement where he says he's studying composition and he says to the teacher, well, what if I want 
want the ensemble to go back to bar 17. And she, of course, says, well, why would you want the ensemble to go back to bar 17? I mean, he's talking about, a, you know, he's talking about Mozart or Beethoven. And he said, and then that's when I realized I had to make up my own approach. And so he really did start with, with written music and moved on from there. I think that the people who do conduction the best are people who approach it not as a gestural language, but as a way to compose, just like you would with pencil and paper, just like you would improvising on chord changes. So it's just, it's a remix, it's a, it's a mashup, and it's a, um, it's just, just a wonderful type of improvisation. Wayne Horvitz has been my guest, composer, keyboardist, band leader, and the architect of What's Going On, Conduction, Improvisation, and the Culture of Structure, a series of concerts and workshops running from Thursday, October 17th through Sunday, November 3rd at the Royal Room in Seattle's Columbia City neighborhood, which is a very nice place to see live music in a club environment, not too loud, not too dark, not too seedy, and not too large either, so I suggest going to theroyalroomseattle.com sooner rather than later to get tickets and the complete schedule. Wayne, it's always fun to chat with you. There's a lot to look forward to in the coming days, so thanks for telling us about it, and we'll see you at the Royal Room. Okay, well, it's absolutely my pleasure, and I really appreciate you doing this. Let's hear some more from Dust to Dust, music by Butch Morris on Flotation Device. <laughs> 